good day. In the chapter, The Social Impetus of Primitive Christianity, Walter Rauschenbusch, page 99, Christianity and the Social Crisis. The radical social spirit of the Jewish Christian churches can also be gauged, in a measure, by the sayings of Jesus. These sayings were kept alive and transmitted by word of mouth for years before any larger attempt was made to record them in writing. And the Jewish churches furnished the collective memory which treasured and preserved them. It is safe to say that in the main only those portions of the teachings of Jesus which in some way were dear and congenial to these churches were thus preserved. If therefore the synoptic teachings of Jesus, as we now have them, are saturated with social thought, it is because such thought echoed the sentiment of the Jewish Christian community. In the preceding chapter I have declined to follow those scholars who ascribe much of the radical social teaching in Luke to Ebionitic, that is, to Jewish Christian influence. If it should be true that any part of that material is not due to Jesus, but to those who, in transmitting his thoughts, consciously or unconsciously, infuse something of their own social passion into them, Jesus would be relieved in part of the charge of radicalism. But the Jewish Christian church would be dyed with a deeper scarlet. We have an interesting example of such an editorial intensification of the social animus or social spirit. The Gospel according to the Hebrews was a very ancient gospel, which originated and circulated in Jewish Christian circles. Only a few fragments of it are preserved. One of them tells the story of the rich young ruler in this form. Said to him the other rich man, Master, what good thing must I do to live? He said to him, Man, do the law and the prophets. He replied, I have. He said to him, Go sell all, all that thou possess and distribute it to the poor and come follow me. But the rich man began to scratch his head, and it pleased him not. And the Lord said to him, How sayest thou, I have done the law and the prophets? For it is written in the law, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And see, many of thy brothers, sons of Abraham, are covered with filth, dying of hunger. And thy house is full of much goods, and nothing at all comes out of it to them. And turning, he said to his disciple Simon, who sat by him, Simon, son of John, it is easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The point, the point of our argument is this. The Jewish Christian communities were numerically and spiritually an important part of early, earliest Christianity. In many respects, they most faithfully preserved the direct impress of Jesus, for they were the product of the same moral environment which had nurtured his mind. But the main current of Christian life, which finally resulted in Catholic Christianity, followed other channels and left Jewish Christianity like a landlocked bay, and of its literary products only a few remnants were preserved. Consequently, the social spirit which glowed in that part of the Christian Church is not adequately represented in early Christian literature as we now know it, and our general impression of the social impetus in primitive Christianity is to that extent weakened and imperfect. It is not at all unlikely that a similar fate befell other writings which shared the same qualities. Again, of those writings which did survive, only a limited number were embodied in the canon of the New Testament, and only those that were embodied are known to the mass of Christian readers today. They have to form their judgment on the nature of original Christianity solely from their impressions of the New Testament. But an impression based only on that material is bound to be one-sided. If the Gospels and the writings of one man were eliminated from our New Testament, the compass of what remains would be very slight. Paul immensely preponderates in the bulk of our material, and so we get the impression that his ideas and points of view were those generally prevailing in the apostolic age. That is probably far from true. In many respects, Paul was a freelance, the propagandist of a new theology, a great dissenter and nonconformist, who was viewed with distrust or hostility by the representatives of an older theology and a more authoritative organization. He was a mind of immense stature and virility, but it was impossible that so intense a spirit should embody all sides of Christianity with equal vigor and in rounded harmony. 
Paul was a radical in theology, but a social conservative, a combination frequently met today. If we assume that in this respect he is an exponent of the whole of primitive Christianity, we may be misled. Yet even Paul was not as apathetic towards social questions as is usually assumed. And finally, the same caution with which we began our study of the social aims of Jesus applies to any study of the social contents of early Christianity. We have not been accustomed to read the records from this point of view. We have read them for spiritual devotion. We have studied them from the theological and ecclesiastical point of view. The records as they lie before us are incomplete and one-sided, and even what does bear on our purposes is overlaid for us by other interests, by preconceptions and long-standing habits of mind. We must stretch a sympathetic hand back to our brothers of the first and second century and see if they do not respond with the warm and mystic clasp that belongs to the order of social Christians of all times. Of course, this discussion will be one-sided too. There is no intention of presenting a rounded picture of the moral and religious life of primitive Christianity. We shall simply try to do justice to the force of the social impetus quivering in it. And then next time, Walter takes up the hope of the coming of the Lord and how that dominated the purview of, of the early Christians. I'll put a link on to, was Paul an apostate? You know, many evangelical Christians that they are are not particularly friendly to the chapter chapters in Acts from 20 to 22 approximately where Paul goes back to Jerusalem one last time and explicitly says there that he went up for the festival and then when he got there and went up to the temple James and the elders of the church in Jerusalem asked him to do something that grates against uh, evangelicals think the the great uncompromising statements of the book of Galatians. So we'll put that on your screen. Was Paul an apostate? And maybe even James too?